Um, this is an oral history for the Carnegie Library, and um, I'm interviewing Shirley Garcia, and um, we're uh, talking on January 19th, 2001, and the interviewer uh, is Dorothy Charlo. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Shirley. And one of the first questions uh, we always ask is, when and where were you born? I was born in El Paso, Texas, uh -huh. in December 1951. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And uh, can you tell me a little bit about your life there, your family, and then what eventually brought you to Colorado? Uh, basically, El Paso is a border town in Texas, and grew up in there. As a matter of fact, my mother still lives in the same home that we were raised in. Uh -huh. uh, my father died when I had just turned 15. And, of course, back in those old days, when I was young, I wanted to grow up and be an astronomer. Uh -huh. uh, but in those days, women went to college to either be school teachers or home economics or stuff like that. So I always was interested in science. Uh -huh. um, but Did my you come from a large family? I had four sisters. Mm -hmm. So there's five girls. Mm -hmm. um, and we all lived there. All my family's still back in Texas. I married my high school sweetheart. Uh -huh. We're still married. We've been married more than 31 years and have two children. And as a matter of fact, my daughter should be graduating this May from CU. Uh -huh. And my son is in basically the same career that I'm in, in waste management, hazardous waste. Uh -huh. he, and he likes science, too. Uh -huh. uh, my husband got transferred out here working for a retail store. And as a matter of fact, the house we bought was in Countryside. And when we signed the papers for our house, we had to sign a waiver that we knew we lived by Rocky Flats. Oh, yes. And at that time... That was a particular period of time, right? it was right? a period of time, and mm -hmm. we had never heard of Rocky Flats. We didn't know what Rocky Flats was. And we asked the real estate agent what Rocky Flats was and why we had to sign this waiver. And he said, well, you really don't have to worry about it. It's just a production facility. And that was the extent of it. He didn't tell us what they were producing. Uh, we were very young at the time, because this was back in 1978. And we didn't know. We didn't even think to ask. We figured a production facility, they were manufacturing parts or something. We didn't know they were bomb parts. Uh -huh. um, so that was the first time we were aware of Rocky Flats, but never thought anything about it. Uh -huh. It happened that uh, the assistant manager of my husband's store went to go work at Rocky Flats. And she's the one who told my husband, go out there and apply, because that's when they were hiring hundreds of, at a time every month. Mm -hmm. And my husband worked out there for a year, and he said, Shirley, you ought to come out here and work. And I said, well, they're not going to want me. I'm just a housewife. I was working retail at JCPenney's, and I figured, why would they hire me? And I applied a year after he started, and within three weeks, I got a call because of my uh -huh. chemical background that I, I had. See. I see. Uh -huh. And uh, I got hired by Jack Weaver, uh -huh. who is the gentleman, if you remember, when we took the tour in 776, yes. the tour us through the building. He's very knowledgeable, very nice man. Yes, I've interviewed him. And um, I interviewed with him, and he hired me on the spot. Uh -huh. And they basically asked me to start work in uh, two or three weeks, and I waited three months before I started work out there. I wasn't sure what I was getting into. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, my husband was working out there, but he basically couldn't give me much information on what he was doing because everything was so secretive. So when now, I was this in what year was it seventy eight? Uh, no, this was I started in eighty two and he 82. started in eighty one. Uh -huh. And what he was dealing with, they basically, you know, told people you don't tell anyone what you're doing because it's top secret and stuff like that. So when I went out there, I didn't know basically what I was getting into. I just knew I was going to be doing something with chemicals. Uh, and that was the extent of it. I do remember when Jack Weaver interviewed me, the one question he did ask, and I remember to this day, he, he didn't ask that much about my educational background or my work ethics. He asked me if I would mind showering with other women or if it would be embarrassing for me to have to get undressed in front of other people. Those are the two questions I remember to this day. Showering with other women, I thought like in high school you still could go in and sprinkle and leave your underwear on. <laughs> And that was not the case. And the getting undressed, I assumed he meant around other women. And later it came to find out it was women and men. Mm -hmm. So that was an awakening for me. And uh, so I went to go work there. And uh, like I had explained earlier, 
When I went in in 1982, I actually started in July of 1982, Rocky Flats was going through a transition where it was mainly a male-dominated workforce, and there were very few women out there. And it was very hard on us as far as women being out there. Do you think that that had anything to do with your being hired to, to work? in the position you were? In, in other words, were they recruiting? I think it was at a time where they had to have, uh, I think, the equal opportunity was forcing them to hire a certain amount, a percentage of minorities, and women mm -hmm. fell into that category. Uh -huh. So it made matters worse for the women that were hired because men were not being hired because they were hiring uh -huh. women. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And most of the men that I started working with, they looked at looked at it as if we were taking jobs away from men that needed to support their families mm -hmm. versus us needing the money. Yeah. So that was so hard in the beginning. So that difficult. Yes. Uh, another thing that was very difficult, I had never been around a lot of men that uh, cussed a lot or that were very abrasive. And it was something to get used to, but you couldn't let them know that it bothered you because they would do it even more. Yeah, yeah. So it was really hard. And I had told you the story the first time uh, I actually was assigned a position to work on a line it was in building 371 on PM shift. Up until then we were working uh, on day shift for training and we were always with a group and our trainer so we were kind of like protected. I was the only lady in my class and there were only seven in our class and every week they were bringing in new employees. Mm -hmm. So when I went to PM shift the first foreman that I had took me to our uh, crew leader that was in charge of the line and introduced me to him and that's when the crew leader said he would not work with any blank blank woman and the foreman just looked at me looked at him and walked off and this left me there with this gentleman that was treating me horrible because I was a lady and uh, it was now, sad. Can you describe what the work was? Uh, we basically in 371 what we were doing is we had big huge furnaces and you would have to load salt and plutonium into them. It was electro refining. And you would, uh, basically it was electric charge and you, we actually made the buttons. Oh. We would make the buttons and after the buttons came out, we would actually stamp the numbers on the buttons, which was also mm -hmm. hard for women because you had to have a lot of force. Because uh -huh. it was a hand stamp and uh, the plutonium is very hard. Yeah. So you Can you describe a little bit for people that would be listening what the button is? A button is basically uh, the trigger on your atomic bomb that actually uh, is fissionable. When you have enough heat generated on it and you have an ignition source, that's what actually will ignite and make your atomic bomb. Your energy is given off. You have a small size button that would be no more than maybe four or five inches mm -hmm. and uh, it could weigh five to seven um, grams. And it was plutonium, and they'd have it tested for purity. One of the hard things in this line, the majority of the process lines, and 371 was a newer building versus 71, the process lines were all engineered and made for men for their height, their long arms. So uh, the few ladies that worked there that were short, and I'm very short, would have to have ladders or footstools. I remember specifically asking if I can even have just a wooden piece of wood to stand on and uh, through the months it would improve and I'd have carpenters that I finally got to know that would make me little footstools and they had finally purchased uh, roll around ladders so that we could actually get into the gloves and look into the windows. The thing with the, but the work you were doing involved being in the gloves. In the gloves. In the glove box. Right, being in the glove in the glove box. Mm -hmm. And we, when we made the buttons the thing with that process was very hard is because when you actually pulled out or we would actually melt the plutonium, we have to bring out what was called a crucible. It was around uh, 10 inches high made out of graphite. And that's where the button would be formed inside with salts. And to pull this out of the furnace, it weighed around 50 pounds. So as a lady, you're working in these gloves that are cumbersome as it is. Your arms aren't long like the men's. So you're trying to reach in, open up this furnace, and pull out this crucible that weighs around 50 pounds and the guys would show you how to do it. Naturally, they would do it and be real easy because they had access to it and they could lift it out with one hand. So as women, a lot of us had to learn a lot of what we call tricks of the trade uh, to be able to get stuff in, to have leverage on stuff. I would always have to find an empty can, put it underneath the furnace, 
pull the crucible out to extend so it could fall on this tall can and then I could set it down. So you're always finding ways or you always have gadgets to reach for stuff that you normally couldn't reach it, uh, if you weren't a man if you didn't have long arms. But you could do that in the gloves. Right. There would be gadgets that were right. available. Right. Or we would have to think of gadgets that we thought with hooks on them or stuff and uh, we would ask for them and then we would just put them in the glove boxes and we'd be able to use them. One of the other stories on that line, not being familiar with tools, I remember once uh, this really nice guy, he ended up being really, real nice. Because once you proved yourself as a worker, they would end up respecting you and they didn't mind working with you. As a matter of fact, they would ask to work with you. When I first started working with him, when he would be working on these furnaces, because we did a lot of our own maintenance to fix things, he would ask for tools and I would know the difference between a crescent wrench or different tools. And it got to a point where I would bring all the tools before we started the job. So he would ask, and I would say, what does it look like? And I would be able to give it to him. And so I learned a lot from him. Uh, learned a lot. Uh, we had all kinds of women out there in the beginning. We had women that made it harder for us, mm -hmm. who wouldn't pull their share of the weight mm -hmm. and use it as an excuse because they're a women. So I made it harder on a lot of the women that were trying to say we're here and we want to pull our own weight. Yeah. That first day, going back to that first day when you were stuck with this, this foreman that didn't want women, <laughs> what what happened then? What? Do you uh, remember? Yeah, eventually it it wasn't the foreman that didn't want oh. women; it was the crew leader. Oh, okay. The foreman didn't want to cause problems, but I think he was just reinforcing the fact that he really had a woman, and back then they felt that they had a woman on their crew, it was going to slow them down, that they wouldn't be as productive working in the glove boxes or whatever they were going to do. Uh, but they didn't want to cause problems. They just figured it was up to the working crew on how they dealt with it. I, see. I also had another foreman in that same building that couldn't handle working with women. He wasn't rude to us. He was very nice and polite, but he couldn't talk to us. We would have our morning meetings and he'd always make it a point to stand in front of us so that his back would always be to us. I just, it's because he just was never used to working with women. And he would always make it a point to tell other men that we were working with, not our leaders, but just our other co-workers, would you please go tell Shirley to do so and so. But that was just his personality. A lot of the men were just not used to working around women. Mm -hmm. And when I uh, got transferred down to 771, it was a totally different world because that's when we were actually working with all the old timers. So it was a lot harder because uh -huh. they did not want women there. Uh -huh. And uh, Now by that time you kind of knew the ropes. Right. Yes. I had how, been how there almost a year. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But coming from 371, which was a clean, beautiful, nice building, going to 71, which was called the hole, was completely different. Uh, very few yeah. people wanted to go work down there. Yeah, I've heard it referred to as the hell hole. The hell hole. Mm -hmm. But it turns out that was one of the best buildings on site because everyone that worked in that building that was accepted became a true family. Mm -hmm. They would do anything for you. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a lot of contamination down there. A lot of people were contaminated. Uh, and that's one of the buildings that uh, we worked in. Sad to say, through these years, a lot of people have passed away yeah. from uh, cancers or different things that we worked with down there. And, uh, and you, do you feel that over the years the contamination just built up and, and, and jeopardized there? I think uh, that or just other factors. I think with Rocky Flats, back even when I started in 1982, the contamination for the radiation was easily detectable because of the instruments we had. If there was airborne contamination, our alarms would go off. I think the thing that concerned me the most now that I look back was the chemicals that we used. Uh -huh. uh, we would have acid spills that would fill up whole rooms. And we would go in and have to clean them up uh, with respirators. So you're inhaling all these fumes and caustic fumes. Uh -huh. We were always working with Freon, different solvents, where they would be absorbed. Uh, can you explain a little bit about why uh, why those acids were needed to, in, in what you were doing? A lot of the acids, especially in 71, were used in the processes where they would use them in the lines to either uh, break down the plutonium so that we could recover it, and a lot of the processes just basically used either acids or caustics for the whole process. 71 was unique in the building that it could recover plutonium from, 
your your Tyvex or anything that had a, a large amount of plutonium. We would incinerate it, take it through a ion exchange, and we would recover the plutonium that we had out of the ash and stuff. And this so would be from old uh, old weapon parts? Not parts, just okay. uh, anything that was anything that had a sufficient amount of plutonium on it. We would even try to recover plutonium off of films from the labs, uh, gloves, anything that had enough of an amount on it that went to the counties that had plutonium. So we were always trying to recover it. And so we always had acids. Uh, the building being so old, we were always having leaks. So uh, if we had an acid spill, we'd take caustic and go throw it on the ground, neutralize it, and clean it up with uh, chem wipes, which are basically large paper towels. Yeah. And we worked a lot uh, with solvents. We were always cleaning stuff. If we worked with ceramics, to actually, uh, those were part of the processes too, to make the actual triggers where you used uh, ceramic cups or rods. We had to clean those by hand with Freon. And Freon is a carcinogen now that we know. that um, We had no protection. But again, it wasn't Rocky Flats' fault because back then the whole industry wasn't aware of the hazards that we have with chemicals. Like I said, radiation people were aware of, because uh, you always had alarms that can tell you. Yeah, yeah. But um, do, now, as you look back on it, does it worry you about your own health in terms of what you... Uh, in particular, the thing that really worries me the most is the contamination that I had from using Freon a lot. I know I'm getting old, but sometimes I think when I have short-term memory loss, and that's one of the things that Freon does to you, it kills your brain cells. Uh, there was one evening when I had first started, when you're new there and, and you're relying on your supervision to take care of your safety, I, would, uh, I worked in a real small room with Freon where you would pour it into a pan to clean these crucibles without any gloves or an without any protection. And uh, Freon makes you feel like you're high. Uh, whiffing it in this small room and the next day when I woke up I had a horrible rash on both my arms. My body was just reacting to me inhaling all that Freon. But I never went to medical because back then I didn't want to cause any problems or say anything because I figured well the men aren't happy that I'm here anyway. I don't want them to think I'm just you know a big crybaby or a wuss. Uh, so that was about the only thing that I think I'm really concerned about is the actual chemicals that we dealt with. Mm -hmm. I didn't work in the lab, so I was lucky with that. I also worked at uh, the ponds, solar ponds, uh -huh. and we didn't use respirators out there. And when I went to the solar ponds, it was in uh, April of 1989. Now, which ponds in particular? Were these the one, uh, can you kind of describe where they are? The solar ponds are on uh, the east side of Rocky Flats. There's basically five holding ponds. You have a pond, which is your largest pond. Uh, these aren't your water ponds. These are actual waste holding ponds that were made to actually uh, allow the wastewater to evaporate. So you had most of the waste from the south side of Rocky Flats go there. Uh, wastewater treatment plant, they were contaminated with uranium, low levels of plutonium, beryllium, which we found now is very hazardous to people's health. And they had uh, a lot of chemicals and they were very high in nitrates. And uh, they had a total of five ponds. Again, like I said, A pond was your largest. You had uh, B pond, which had three small ones. And then C pond was the worst pond because it was very corrosive. That was one of the ponds they told us you would never want to fall into because it was so corrosive. And when I went to go work out there, they had uh, the story with the concrete. Remember, they made all this concrete and that wasn't didn't. any good. It didn't solidify. Mm -hmm. So we had to go back and open every single one of the boxes, or if they were bagged, rip open the bags so that the water would leak out so they could dry a little so we could go in and either try to solidify them or repackage them. And the ones that were hard, uh, we had to test for the hardness so they could be shipped off site. But we did all of this without respirators. And I think uh, two years after that, when I actually, the one good thing about Rocky Flats is you had to have an annual physical. And they provided you with that physical. And I actually had BE show up in my blood as being sensitive to it. And that's the only place that I think I could have been impacted by BE. Uh -huh. And uh, when they asked me that, they assumed I had gotten it from golf clubs. 
because golf clubs have beryllium in them. And, right. and I told them, well, I don't golf. Yeah. <laughs> so that's out. So it's yeah. got to be from the site. Yeah. And lo and behold, that's when a lot of people were sick from uh, beryllosis. People that were doing what you were doing. Uh, not they, what I was doing, but, but on the cold side, they were dealing with actual yeah. BE. Got, yeah. We're sick from it. Uh -huh. And it took a long time. That was one of the sad things for them to admit that they had a problem with that. Yes. I worked with people that came. We called it the cold side, where they had most of the BE operations on the I south see. side. The cold side, meaning that means it's there's no... Uh, no plutonium. Plutonium, right. And it's on the south side, basically, of the site. I worked with a lot of uh, men that used to work on the cold side, and they remember eating back in the areas, working with the BE, coming out with black all over them, taking that stuff home, and their wives would be mad at them. And I just think back now and say, what a hazard that was. Yeah. It was, And it's sad. Yeah. yeah. Do you know very many uh, workers that are sick with ber berylliosis? I don't know them personally because mm -hmm. I always worked on the plutonium side of the facility. Uh, so, no, I haven't. There's only one gentleman that I know, that, and his name is Ron Roish, but he doesn't have BE, but he still works out there, uh, bless his heart. Mm -hmm. He goes around, he has to breathe oxygen all the time, and uh -huh. he worked in the BE building for many years. Uh -huh. His emphysema is really real bad right now. Mm -hmm. Well, what, um, how long would you say it took for for the men to kind of get used to women. I suppose there were some who never did. Right. Uh -huh. And I started in 82, and I would say by the late 80s, early 90s, uh, the culture was totally different. Because back then when I started, you only had one decontamination room. So if you got contaminated, uh, you were either in there showering with the men, or you had to wait your turn. And when I left uh, actually working in the areas, I started out as an hourly person. And in 1989, I went uh, salary. And by then, they had already made uh, decon rooms, or what we refer to as, for women and for men. Because uh -huh. one of the times... originally, it was all together. It was all together. How did that uh, go? I would think that in some ways, the men would have been as upset by that as the women. Uh, yeah, but again, women being modest and not speaking up, as most women do, uh, normally ended up waiting their turn. I, see. I had in uh, Building 771, we were actually tearing down a supply to your house, which is a house that you make all out of plastic, and you build it. Uh, what we were doing is there was a tank, a high-level tank, and they have rashing rings in them that are filled with boron so that the contents of the tanks don't go critical. So you won't have a criticality. But those tanks, because of the, all the acid that go through these tanks, end up eventually eating the glass. So every so many years, depending on what tank it was, you had to go in, drain the tank, and physically, by hand, remove all these rings. And it, it, it's a very heavy job. It's very time-consuming. You're in supplied air. Uh, and it, it's very heavy, even for a woman, because you're lifting five-gallon buckets of glass. And it's very heavy. So you had to build these, um, we called them tents, plastic tents around to contain all the contamination. And they would put uh, air movers on, which sucked in the air so the contamination wouldn't be released, to contain all the contamination. And it was on a Saturday, and we were supposed to tear down this supply to your house. They had gotten, they identified a certain amount of people that can do this without crapping up a whole room, contaminating a room. And uh, I was on the team that was able to do that. And this one Saturday, and there are some people out there that we never liked working with either because they were just bad luck. You knew that you didn't want to work with them. And it wasn't that they were safe. They just weren't aware of what they were doing a lot of times. Just more klutzy. Right, more klutzy, or they didn't think, or they never could get down the process. 71, you had, there were miles and miles of lines, and you had to know where all these lines went when you were transferring liquids to a tank and what valves are shut off and which one's not. And they just could never comprehend a lot of this stuff. But that one Saturday, we started to tear down the house, and we ran into problems. And I think there was a crew of seven of us, and uh, we lost it because one of the guys that was working with us, you start at one end at the opening. The painters will go in, they'll paint the inside to contain the contamination, but you have to work fast to get this big, huge house down, roll it up to get it into a drum. 
And one of the guys that we were working with was happened to be one of these klutzy guys, and he was at the end. We put him out of the way, hoping he would stay out of the way, but he cut the rope down where our air mover was. So the end of the house actually fell down on the air mover, so we lost that suck on the house of the year. So rather than losing the room, what happened is all the monitors, the RCTs, the technicians, rather than losing that whole room, they just started throwing um, KW, which is like a soap, all over the place because if you wet the airborne contamination, it's not going to go airborne. And we just had papers on because we were planning on everything being okay. But what happened is the people that had paper coveralls on, that contamination adhered to our skin. And uh, by 11 o'clock, we had we were all contaminated, including the RCT that was working with us, and we lost the whole room. But lost the whole room. Can you explain what you mean by that exactly? Okay, we had a room, and by losing a whole room, that means by losing it, the whole room got contaminated. Okay. And what you want to do is if you ever lose control of your contamination, you want to prevent losing a room because you know everyone's going to have to come in and decontaminate the room. And it's very hard because all the contamination goes up high and you have to start at the top, and it can take days or weeks or months to, to decon one of these rooms. Mm -hmm. And at that time when we all got uh, contaminated really, real bad, we had one decon room, and I was the only lady. So naturally, uh, the guys went in. They took Together. their turn mm -hmm. while I waited, but it turned out I was the most contaminated person. So in reality, what should have happened, they should have said, Shirley, you go in first, first. Yeah. and let the guys wait. So They what, didn't say ladies first. No. <laughs> <laughs> that never worked. No, no. I can see that that would not happen. Uh, so uh, I waited and waited till they came out, and then I went in not realizing how contaminated I was. Uh, went into the shower, but I had been so contaminated that going into the shower, the contamination that was in my hair washed all the way down on my body, which was the worst thing I could have done. And normally you always take cold showers so that you don't open the pores on your skin so the contamination does not go into your skin. And I had lukewarm water and uh, back then in those days they could scrub you a little in the buildings to try to get you cold and if not then you'd have to go up to medical. So about an hour, hour and a half passed, and I was still crapped up. So I had to go up to medical, and uh, again, being Saturday, the medical wasn't open, so the EMTs came. And this was the first time, which was really ironic, is because my husband was working that day in the same building. But he stood behind, again, like I said, 71's like a family. He stood behind to help contain the contamination in that room while I went up to medical, and the EMTs took care of me. And what they literally do, and uh, to this day after it happened to me, I warned everybody, they literally will take a bristle brush and they will scrub you. And what happened with me is they took whisk first to see if it would come off, a soapy solution. It didn't come off, and they actually took Clorox. But it wasn't diluted, and I had found out after the fact they're not supposed to use pure Clorox on you. And they would scrub me down with that. Oh, must have been very painful. Well, it hurt, but they still did it, but you know you're contaminated and you want it taken off. Um, and they did this for approximately eight hours off and on. But prior to that, uh, one of the RCTs that went up to medical, they actually uh, put plastic bags like around me when I went up in the guard's vehicle. They put plastic on the seat and they took me and this other gentleman that I worked with a lot and we went up to medical. And when we went up to medical, uh, how were you treated there? Very nice. Because mm -hmm. back, uh, back then, uh, again, I was blessed because the people I was working with were very good friends of my husband. And even to this day, it's sad to say, as many years as I worked out there, when even this last time we went back, they don't say, hi, Shirley. They say, you're Rich's wife. <laughs> I'm still my husband's wife, you know. <laughs> but uh, when I went out there, I was fortunate because one of the the technicians that was checking me was one of my husband's friends. And even though you're embarrassed, but you know that you're crapped up, you need to have him check you. And I was down to just my panties. And uh, I was scared. It's the first time I've ever been so crapped up. And I was scared, and he kept checking me. They kept sending me in and out of the shower, and then uh, he was checking me out. My backside, he said, Shirley, you're, you're still real hot. 
but I didn't want to take my panties off in front of him. <laughs> you know, you're thinking, okay, uh, but we're still modest, and he's, I know he's my husband's friend, but there's at a point where I, I, I just told him I can't, I need a, a lady technician, an RCT. And at that time, they had very few. And uh, it just so happened I had been in there already so many hours that this was a uh, change of shift, and a lady technician was coming on on PM shift. Mm -hmm. So they finally sent her up right away. And we didn't think, my husband was there, I could, I don't know why to these, we laugh, and we didn't think that, that, he that he could have yeah. come up there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was just so busy trying to control what was happening down there, and he yeah. felt that was in good hands. And I don't think yeah. anyone realized the extent of my contamination. Yeah. In between my toes, everywhere. Oh. Um, so that night, we got home, it was around 10 o'clock at night, I was crying, I was tired from being in and out of the shower, and I, I was just raw, and uh, I came home and my husband says, well honey, if you want to feel better, why don't you take a shower? <laughs> <laughs> he was being sincere. Was, yeah. And, just <laughs> and then I really just started bawling and crying, because I had been in the shower all day long, and I think that's the one time in my life I said, I don't want to go back there. And the next day I woke up, I had scabs from my neck all the way down, my back and my arms. And uh, when I went into medical the next day, because uh, I couldn't go back into the area, they gave me a, they only had one little tu tube with this balm or something left from my sc scabs. But they didn't want to give me their last tube, so I remember them actually putting some out on a little container and giving it to me. And then I went back into work. Naturally, I couldn't go back into the area. And me and my friend, basically, we both were pretty bad, scabbed over. And that's when I actually realized that they're not supposed to use straight Clorox. Oh, yeah. Had I known, I would have said not to do that. Yeah. But I went back and, uh, again, not thinking about me or my friend Don, not thinking about himself. We felt bad for our coworkers that had to go back in and clean up the room. Mm -hmm. And that's 71 because you always wanted to protect your workers, yeah. your friends, yeah. your family. So it was really a team. Yeah. 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 How did you, you know, it was really just the one fellow's fault, really. Right. How, how did, did, did people get upset with him? I mean, how was that kind of thing handled? You just figure that's the breaks of it or was it? Well, that was the breaks of it. No, it's, and, and they were always. On every shift, there was always one of those persons, uh -huh. and uh, they so normally try to keep them out of the way. Yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, that guy that did that still works out there, but they had removed him eventually. I don't know, after, I think it was like seven or eight years from actually working back in the process mm -hmm. areas. Mm -hmm. I know of two people that actually were removed. That was a problem with the union. I was in the union. I loved being part of the union, but I felt a lot of times the union were protecting the wrong people. They helped people with wages and stuff like that, but uh, there's a lot of times they were fighting, I think, for the wrong cause. Mm. A lot of the people I felt that worked in the area should have never been back in that area. Mm -hmm. So you would have felt that there are certain people it's just better to remove right. to some other kind of work. But you couldn't do that because of the union. Uh -huh. You had to be able to justify it. I see. And then being in the union, you're not allowed to say anything bad about another union member. So that was a very sensitive subject. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and it would be funny because you had a certain group of workers that uh, the foreman knew they could rely on us to get stuff done. And if they needed to put a, this certain type of person there, they figured, well, they can babysit them. And it would be taken care of that way. Yeah. So that, did, that happened quite a bit. Mm -hmm. but, and the people would come and go. It's, so you worked, now, was your, your job title a uh, chemical operator? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I started out as a chemical operator okay. from 1982 to 1989. Uh -huh. And then, like I said, in 89 was the first time um, we were shut down because of the Tiger team. Yes. We weren't doing anything, and uh, there were certain people that just couldn't handle going in. I wasn't a card player. And at Rocky Flats, you took your breaks, you played cards, and I was one that never played cards. And when we were shut down, people played cards all day long. Oh, really? So there was uh, a lot of people wanted stuff to do, and I wasn't one that I said that played cards. So that's when I actually went to the solar ponds 
to have something to do during the shutdown. I see. Now, the shutdown, um, are you referring to uh, the FBI raid? No, prior to that. Prior to that, okay. I think it was about Can a year, just... year and a half before that. Okay. We had a, a national team called the Tiger Team that came out and looked at the sites and looked at all the safety issues. Yeah. And we basically were shut down because of our safety issues. I don't remember particularly what they were. But, uh, you know, again, like I said, I can look back. When we ran all those lines where we supposedly made bomb triggers, we never once ran them with a procedure that you could use. It was all by word of mouth. So it was very important that you had a good working rapport when you went on a line to work with someone so that they would give you the right information. You mean that the written procedures were not what you followed? Right. You couldn't because follow them. They couldn't wouldn't work. Follow. They wouldn't work. They wouldn't work. So okay. the only way you learn how to actually run a line is through word of mouth, someone coming and showing you this is what you need to do, and this is how you do it. The thing with 71, there were so many different process lines, so many glove boxes, so many, and it was, since it was an aqueous, water lines, a lot of the processes were water. You had to rely on a lot of the, the people to do stuff, but we were shorthanded a lot of the time, so they would actually throw you on a line and say, here, we're shorthanded, come work this line, which you knew nothing at all about, and then everyone would go to lunch and leave you there alone. So to this day, I say I'm surprised. We never had a criticality out there. Yeah. Uh, and people to this day can't believe me. They said, I don't know how many times I worked on lines for the first time alone. Even if it's for an hour, to me, it's, that was one of the scariest things I remember. Oh, yeah. Working on lines thinking, what if something happens? Yeah, and you, you would be very frightened yourself. Right, yes. For, uh, In case, because you know, something could always go wrong, and especially mm -hmm. with your lines, your aqueous lines, if uh, you overflowed a glove box, it would go on the floor and contaminate the floor and all kinds of stuff. So that's one of the things that really scared me more than anything. And again, not wanting to speak up or cause problems for a lot of times, I didn't say anything. Uh, my personality did change a lot after the years. I learned that I had to speak up. And I learned a lot of times that I had to say, no, uh, you can't leave me on this line because I don't know it. Mm -hmm. And pe some people would get mad, some wouldn't. Some would say, well, I'll stay back with you. So that worked out really real good. You had your people that we were slower workers that would end up working the slow lines that would read all day back in the area. And then you had your group of people that were your better workers, that they were always moving from the fast lines. And the sad thing, those are, those are the ones that were exposed the most, because those were the hottest lines, yeah. as far as radiation exposure. Mm -hmm. And I had a problem once, I don't remember what year it was, I think it was 84, 85, where we were working with fluorides that were really hot. And everyone I was working with kept getting pulled off the jobs because their exposures were too high. And mine wasn't. Mine kept coming back zero. And I didn't think anything about it. And I had a wonderful foreman at the time. His name was Norm Wetzel, and he no longer works out there. And uh, I think it was after six months, they kept pulling these people off because their exposures were too high. And I was the only one who kept staying. And at first, uh, he called and he called the dosimetry, which actually count mm -hmm. what are on that, our badges. That you wear. Yeah, mm -hmm. we actually wore one on our arm wrist, and we actually wore one near our badge. And their first reply is, "Well, maybe she works faster than the other people, or maybe she's not handling it as much as these other people, and maybe that's why her exposure is not like anyone else's." So we let that go. And so after six months, thankfully for my foreman, he said, "There's something wrong." And uh, he didn't give him any warning. He took me and we went up there to the cemetery uh, to actually sit down with the manager and ask them uh -huh. what the issues were and wanted to know. And uh, luckily we had that meeting. We came back with the same response. They weren't sure they were going to look into it. But someone that was working there called my foreman the next day and uh, felt there was a problem because what had happened is they had never put in those little things that they count on your badge. I forgot what they're called now. So it was a defective badge. Right. It, it was never reading anything. And rather than saying we made a mistake, the only problem was we could understand how it went on for six months because every month you would turn in your badge. Oh. And uh, luckily we so had that. So they weren't being checked. 
always. Right. And that that was just me, how many other people actually don't know what they were exposed to. Yeah. So uh, I actually filed a, a safety concern. I don't know what I was exposed to. So I ended up, uh, again, my foreman backed me and he fought for me a lot. Uh, they actually gave me a letter saying during this time period, they don't know what I was exposed to, but they came up with the number. But what they did in the first letter that they generated is they gave me the minimal amount of exposure that anyone had in 71. And uh, my boss actually took me back up there again. I kept going up there and he said, this isn't right. These are the people she worked with. These are their exposures. And you're, why are you giving her this? So they ended up compromising. I ended up getting an average exposure. But Whereas I, you should have had the highest. Highest. That's what he felt. But they couldn't do that. So I ended up having an average exposure for this time period. But what happened is, again, by making waves, which I found out you, you normally don't do, uh, they ended up pulling me out of the area because of my exposure not knowing for sure what it was. Mm -hmm. And they sent me up to building 664. And I felt like I was being punished for something that wasn't my fault. That it was basically to get me out of a hot area mm -hmm. so I can get my average exposure for the year. Yeah. Did, did you feel that um, you, you felt you were being punished in the sense of, but did you not feel relieved that you weren't going to have to be exposed? Uh, no, I think that's why I felt I was being punished because I felt like I'm being taken away from my family. I see. It's, yes. it's all yeah. out in the open now. Everything's under control. And as long as I know my badge is working right, uh -huh. everything's okay. Because every uh -huh. year anyway in January, you would go back to zero. No matter what you had as far as exposure, every year you'd go back to zero. Uh -huh. So uh, I, don't, I don't remember now. It was three months or six months I was sent to this building where I wouldn't receive any high doses mm -hmm. of, of radiation exposure. But I was away from my friends, and I was put in a position where you would sit all day while you counted these crates. Oh, I see. And if you're used to working or moving or working in glove boxes, it's hard. Yeah. So I felt I was being punished for that, even though that's not what it was. Yeah. 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 So that's one of the few times it was hard if, if mistakes were made mm -hmm. to get them to say, yes, we're mm -hmm. sorry, we made a mistake. Mm -hmm. Similar to the BE. Right. Do you think, uh, I mean, was the union helpful in that, or were, was that not? Uh... At that particular point, no, it was my foreman that actually uh, was fighting for me. Because in the department that I was in, uh, we assayed all the material. And it was the one department that usually had higher exposures than the rest of the other chemical operators anyway. Because we were dealing with the small cans, the fluoride, the green cake, the oxides that had a lot of uh, radiation. A lot of the cans you would pick up, you could feel the warmth of them. Uh, fluorides were some in particular that once you put them in, even in the 10 gallon cans, uh, you could feel the warmth of them sometimes. Mm -hmm. So that one group we had had a tendency to have much higher exposures than the rest of the workers. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why he was very protective of us. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. But uh, and to this day, I still have that litter. And luckily, had that person never called, I don't think I would have ever known. The person called just to, uh, was it just some conscientious person? Mm -hmm. yeah. The person that was working in there and they overheard what we were concerned right. were and they're the ones that called mm -hmm. and uh, told us basically what was wrong with our pets. And I think if you talk to a lot of other people, uh, you'll feel a lot of them didn't have confidence in even what we were told what our exposures were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sounds like it was probably a combination of factors. Right. Just from, from mm -hmm. your example. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't say it was just one problem, but probably right. a whole range, a whole range of, of problems yeah. that created that. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you think that most of the badges worked accurately? You know, obviously yours didn't, but. Yes, I did. And mm -hmm. after that is where they actually uh, went in and changed a lot of the things of the system. So you can say out of every bad mm -hmm. case, something good comes of it. And they went in and changed the system. They had to go in and uh, they started documenting what badges they picked up, which ones they didn't. Uh -huh. 
when they read them and did this, they changed a lot of the whole system on what they did. So I think it alleviated that a badge couldn't fall through the cracks. There were a lot of times where people's badges were picked up when we would turn them in, so they would keep using the same old one. So if your bag, uh, badge wasn't picked up, you had 24 hours to go take it up to the cemetery yourself. So they made a lot of good changes. Mm -hmm. I used to always say Rocky Flats is just like the book. It's the worst of times. It's the best of times. Because uh, I would get up and I would look forward to going to work. You'd go socialize. To me, it was like a country club in a way. And I'd always laugh and joke. We wore white coveralls. So I say it's just like a country club. We all come to this special place that hardly anyone's allowed to go. <laughs> we wear the same outfits. <laughs> wear gloves. gloves. <laughs> we would have good times. Uh, uh -huh. We'd go down so the halls dancing and singing. So you had uh -huh. a really good time, but you uh -huh. knew what the hazards were. Yeah. And you were aware of them all the time. Mm -hmm. You had to always be on guard. And uh, you, well, you saw from going to 76, working back there, you're always thinking behind your mind what you're doing. You have to be aware of what you're doing because of the implications yeah. that you may not only be doing to something to yourself, but to your coworkers. Mm -hmm. So you're always aware of everything that you're doing. Mm -hmm. But you still have good times. When a, a room would get crapped up and we'd have to get our full faces on and get totally decked out to go in and decon, we still had a good time because we knew we were working with a group of people that we could rely on and we knew it was a job we had to go in and do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, we, like I said, I used to love getting up in the morning and going there. It was fun. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And that uh, your work in production actually then stopped before uh, when your your part was shut down uh, before the FBI raid, right? Uh, well, or, or yes and you? no, because everything had shut down because of the tiger team's report, and we were just about starting up again, not in the actual plutonium processes, but other things like the solar ponds. Uh -huh. And that was one of the reasons I went out to the solar ponds, because they were redoing all the bad uh, semen and things that really didn't harden up. Mm -hmm. And I went out there. I started in April, and then that summer is when we got raided by the FBI. Uh -huh. And when we actually got raided, I was actually outside. Um, most of the the solar ponds uh, cemented things were out on asphalt pads mm -hmm. and at the time what we were doing is we were going through and verifying and if they had uh, they would cover them with big huge bags and if the bags had a lot of water in we would actually go slit the bags let all the water come out and be released so the cement would solidify a little better uh, and helicopter kept going by and we had a what is it no airspace where people couldn't fly over right. And this helicopter kept going by, and we kept thinking, boy, it's the news again, because we had helicopters go by previously because of the Tiger team, and we were shut down uh, within the past year. And so we thought, oh, it's the news. They're going to get in trouble. But this time, it kept coming closer and closer, and we didn't realize what had happened. We were outside. We didn't have access to a PA system, so we didn't know what was happening. And I just remember a big, huge bus going by a bus that we had never seen before really going by. We didn't know what was happening. And um, all the gates were locked. We couldn't go in, you couldn't go out. And that's when it happened. But it was very scary because we didn't know they were the FBI. I'm lucky I wasn't in the buildings because from what my friends have told me, they have scary stories. Uh, but previously, you have to remember, even up to a few years before then, we were... Uh, trained if you had terrorist attacks when we were having problems, we had increased security, yeah. uh, we didn't know what to expect. So here we see this helicopter, here we see this bus going by, and we didn't know what to think. Yeah. And uh, from what a lot of my friends told me, from the, when they actually went into the buildings, because they had all their guns out, our guards had all their guns out, and it was basically a standstill, not knowing what to do. And you would have never thought the FBI would raid Rocky Flats. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, disheartening because mm -hmm. a lot of these people for years really, I think, put their health on the line. Not, not It wasn't just the good pay that people say that they get. Mm -hmm. uh, we went out there, we protected each other, and we were actually doing something, I think, for the good of the country. And then for the FBI to come in and do what they did was like a slap in the face. Yeah. Uh, they went back into the areas, the contaminated areas, 
and you never came out of those areas unless you had everything checked out to make sure you didn't have anything that was contaminated. And uh, they, FBI wouldn't let them check their guns. And we were just trying to say, we just want to make sure you're not taking any contamination outside of the area. And they wouldn't do that. And uh, it wasn't a good experience. And I had worked in 71 previous to that. And I had gotten involved because the accusations of the incinerator. They had said the incinerator was running. And back to the incinerator. The incinerator is something that you can't start up in one shift and shut down. It takes two or three shifts just for it to cool down because you're burning over 2,000 degrees centigrade. It takes a while to bring the temperature down and then you'd have to clean it up. So you're talking about something that would take a minimal two days to do. And how I got involved is when I was in that old group that was called NDA, I moved the drums to this one room at Thanksgiving time. And these were drums where the contents would be burned in the incinerator. And since Rocky Flats was closed down at Christmas, I had moved the drums there. We knew we weren't going to use them. This was prior to Thanksgiving, so I moved them back into a storage area. So you wouldn't have these drums so people wouldn't be exposed out in the area. And it happened in December. We thought prior to the shutdown, we were going to start up again with the incinerator. So I moved the same set of drums back to this, what is it, staging area is what we called for the incinerator. And uh, they never ran the incinerator. So I moved these drums back, and uh, I was the one who signed my name on the paperwork. Whenever you moved anything, you had to sign that you were moving it from this room to that room or wherever you were moving it. And uh, FBI called me in and questioned me and wanted to know about these drums. I didn't know what drums they were talking about. I didn't have any paperwork. And what was disheartening is because right off the bat, they assumed that I was lying. Mm -hmm. And they flat out said, we know you're going to be lying to protect the company. And that, that wasn't the case. Yeah. And uh, the second time when they finally called me in and talked to me is when they finally showed me the paperwork. And you can move hundreds of drums. Back in those days, you could still remember some of the drum numbers. Mm -hmm. And luckily I remembered, well, we took those. It didn't run, so I moved them back, and I brought them back because we were going to uh, burn them again. And then after that, it was okay. Uh -huh. It was very scary when they take you into a room right off the bat assume yeah. that you're lying to protect someone. But then again, they went off of information that was mm -hmm. given to them. That, mm -hmm. And they did find some of the things. Mm -hmm. I admit that, but uh, it was a really hard time back then for us. I think we all felt like we had a big black eye. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And they we were doing something really, real bad. And there were. The solar yeah. ponds was a perfect example, I felt. Mm -hmm. And that's why I left the solar ponds. They were doing a lot of things that I felt was not right. Uh -huh. that, you, that you personally knew were not the right. appropriate way. And I would let the foreman know, and that's mm -hmm. why I finally left the department. Uh -huh. Uh, that was in 89. I was barely had started going back to college. Oh, uh -huh. and now you had, you had, uh, you were working and your children were still? Yes, by, my children by then, uh, my son was around 10, my daughter was around 15. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So what had happened is I had started to go back to school to learn about all these new regulations that were coming out. Mm -hmm. So I had just enough information to make me dangerous, which wasn't good. <laughs> I look back and say, I can't believe I said some of this stuff. Or <laughs> but we did some of the stuff that I, that's still wrong with the pond creek because uh -huh. cutting up the bags and letting it go on the ground, that to me is intentional spills. Yeah. Just certain things. Uh -huh. And I would ask and I'd say, well, that doesn't seem right. Uh -huh. But then we were all on a learning curve. Mm -hmm. We had uh, never had to abide by these laws until we were sued. And then a lot of the stuff came, fell under RECRA law, so we were forced, and we were all learning together. Yeah, and so there really was that shift that, that Rocky Flats had to start abiding by mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the environmental laws. Right, which it hadn't and changed that whole culture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we had to learn, so I ended up leaving the solar ponds because there were just things that I was not comfortable with. Uh -huh. And that's where a lot of the fines came out of, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. to this day I, I hear still hasn't been paid. That's what I have heard. I didn't know whether for sure yeah. that was true. But I'm not sure, but it was about a month ago I still heard they hadn't paid mm -hmm. those fines. Mm -hmm. And that was this, this, the suits that were um, precipitated by Jim Stones, or, or was he, was that just one piece of it? 
which one was Jim Stone's? Jim Stone was a fellow that I have interviewed who was kind of a whistleblower. Right. But I'm not sure which suit his generated. Okay. I know in the FBI that basically was because his incinerator was running because of the two ladies oh. that had made those accusations. Uh huh. And uh, I worked with both those ladies. And, I see. Uh, it was a very hard time working when that whole incident came up because. Can you do you have you put together what you know why they made those accusations or do you have any thoughts about it? Uh, well, it's really ironic because one of the ladies when I left Rocky Flats, I went to go work at the DOE facility in Grand Junction. One of those ladies in particular got hired on out there. And I don't think they realized what had happened, and uh, I was dumbfounded for a DOE facility to hire this person. You think this would have come up in her, of course, we didn't have to have clearances in Grand Junction, uh -huh. but you think this would have come up. And it was the uh, first couple times when I was around her, I didn't have the guts to ask her. And we finally ended up working a lot together because they had hired her to work on a specific project. And I finally asked her why she made those accusations. I think a lot of them were because this other lady told her these things had happened, so she assumed they were truths. Uh, but she actually lived with one of the foremen, and he had told her that the incinerator had run. Oh. So, but even I told her, how could you believe that you've ran this line? You yourself would know. Uh, the other one, I think, of what had happened, it ended up snowballing. You start saying one thing, and it just got worse and worse and worse. But so she may she said one thing, and then kind of started half believing it. Or half, yeah. Or you know, after a while, if you say it so much uh -huh. that you tend to believe it, yeah. and that can happen really easy, and oh, you okay. lose track of reality. Or even me with my stories, this is how I perceive them, and they could have been years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what happened. But what was really hard is when that did happen, those two ladies were still working side by side with us. And they continued to make false accusations. And uh, not then it was the accusations they started to make about us, the co workers. And anytime anything happened, they were on the phone calling the FBI or. Uh, I forgot what other organization, because they were under the Witness Protection Program oh, also, oh. saying that they were being harassed, et cetera, and things like that. Um, they accused us of trying to contaminate them, just all, all kinds of stuff. This, this was after the raid, then? This was after yes, the raid. Right. And, and then we knew they that the witness right, they were in the Witness Protection Plan. They mm -hmm. knew they were in the program. Supervision was scared to death of them. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to cause any problems. They didn't want to, because... Uh, these ladies had actually made accusations against specific supervision and management. And they eventually later took these people to court and put them through the ringer. Mm -hmm. And it's hard because uh, to the state, I don't understand why they were believing these two women over a whole building mm -hmm. of employees. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this one lady that went to the Grand Junction facility, when I finally asked her that, she really believed in her heart that the incinerator did run, and uh -huh. what she did wasn't wrong. Uh -huh. But a lot of the information she got was from the other co-worker. Uh -huh. That's fascinating. Yes, and, yeah. uh, and she, she ended up uh, quitting out there in the Grand Junction facility. Uh, too much pressure for her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But those ladies uh, were characters. I remember... Uh -huh. the Had you kind of... Would you have defined them as characters even beforehand? Or? Yes. Uh -huh. When they first walked in to, remember I told you they were hiring so many people every week. And they, we would go to a training class down at the CETA Center for three weeks. They showed us how to work in a glove box, how to change a glove, how to transfer liquids, open valves, and stuff like that. And then they sent you out to Rocky Flats to work the lines. The first time they were walked into the cafeteria, because they would bring you to show you the building, one of the ladies had on skin-tight blue jeans that tied up the sides. Well, they weren't blue jeans, they were beige. Tied up the sides all the way to her waist with no underwear on. <laughs> and to this day, I remember this. And uh, the guys, like I said, were very abrasive, those men. They were, uh, I remember they all started howling and making cat calls and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> and. Uh, 
I remember them to that day because of that. Uh, they were just their own type of women. I would complain because they wouldn't wear underwear under the coveralls. And that's just me. It, I, I look back now and I said, it shouldn't have bothered me. That's their life. But I would think if they get their coveralls contaminated and they drop their coveralls, because there were ladies that wouldn't wear bras or just so if they dropped. We had all kinds of ladies that I said. And there were ladies mm -hmm. that they dropped their coveralls and didn't have a bra on. It was a thrill for the guys. And I would just think, like, how can they be like that? And I look back now. They're young. They were... Mm -hmm. But uh, these two ladies in particular did not wear underwear. And uh, I would go to the foreman, and I would say they're working in the glove box. I don't want to see this stuff. <laughs> and they'd wear skin-tight coveralls, skin-tight coveralls. I said, could you please make them underwear, but wear underwear. Foreman didn't want to get involved in that. <laughs> <laughs> they said, surely don't bring us those problems. <laughs> but, uh, and to me, that's why I say they were characters, and that's why I was surprised yeah. that they came up with those accusations. Yeah. Was, Do you feel free to use their names, or would you prefer not to? I would prefer not to. Okay. I know, I'm right. pretty sure everyone knows who they are. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, one of them I, I think it is a matter of public knowledge. Yeah, but I think one of them still has some lawsuits outstanding okay. or something. Yeah. I'm not sure. That's the last that I heard from the other lady in Grand Junction. We also have, uh, they had cameras. To me, these are other stories. Because first, when we started working with the men, they hated us. And then we found out that they started liking a lot of the women, which we went from one extreme to another. And then they had cameras back in the areas. And uh, I tell people this to this day, and they're shocked. They said they caught a lot of couples having sex back in the areas. Uh, and they'd be on camera. And a lot of these couples were married to other people that worked out there. A lot of marriages broke up because of that. I mean, a lot of marriages broke up because of that. And uh, it was funny, rumor mills, that's all Rocky Flats was. We'd always joke and say they should make a soap opera at Rocky Flats because of everything that was going on. Uh, people would be caught on film and not be embarrassed. But everyone and is these just were cameras that people would just bring back for? No, they're security cameras. They would have see, little cameras I, oh, like in the lines because of security okay, reasons. Right. And if they were on in certain rooms or whatever, and people would go back, not even realize it. Uh -huh. But you would think after a while, everyone knew they had cameras. It still didn't stop. And there was one lady in particular, too. Her mother was a guard, and she was always getting caught. And uh, I just felt sorry for her mom. <laughs>